It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. Hello, it's Jill on Money. How are you? September, nice weather. Getting into that end of year mindset yet? Not yet. I do. Once I've paid my, that that tax bill for the quarterly taxes, I'm already looking at December. That's what I do. Anyway, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios here in New York. And we are delighted that you have joined us. You can get in touch with us a couple of different ways if you've got a financial question. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You can also reach us, jillonmoney.com. That's the website. We've got a contact button, the upper right-hand corner. Easy peasy, right? While you're on the website, there's going to be a little prompt. Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. And you should. There's good stuff in there. We do like to begin the program with a caller, and we are doing that today. So we are going to start with Bob from Philadelphia. Jill, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. This is a real treat. Uh, the question I have is I'm trying to protect my downside as I look ahead to not retirement, but what my next uh, opportunity is. I've been with the same company for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, They do not have a pension, but I've been uh, saving in a 401k. uh, And now I'm just concerned that if there's something that occurs like in 2008, I would. I don't want to see half of it disappear and then have to, you know, work until I'm 75. Mm, I hate that idea. Also, so tell me about yourself and the money you have. Kind of the general situation. How old are you? Married? All that fun stuff. Sure. Okay. I am 56 years old. Um, I am married. I have three kids. Uh, my current salary is $150,000. Uh, my wife is a nurse. She makes $50,000 working part-time, three days a week. Uh, we have no debt to speak of. Um, we put two kids through school already with a third uh, waiting to, to go in two years. Uh, and then as far as retirement monies are concerned, I have 600000 in a 401k. She has 200000 in a 403b. Uh, we have a combined Roth of 125, and then other investments of 125, with 40,000 dollars in cash. Then we have some money set aside for in a 529 for uh, number three. And then, like I said, no debt on uh, house is paid for. But uh, I, I, I'm in a I'm in a place where the the folks in my office, uh, I'm there, there's a group of guys that are about 10 years older than me mm-hmm. that were really impacted by what happened. Um, 10 years ago, mm-hmm. and they've had to delay getting, you know, moving on. And I just look at those guys, and they, they're struggling because what they thought they had uh, disappeared, and they've been kind of working back over that period of time. So that's kind of what is is making me ask these questions. Yeah, I think that's that's very smart of you. How much longer do you think you are likely to work, Bob? I would like to work in this particular job probably for another three or four years. Okay. And then transition into something that I know will pay far less. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done some volunteer work. I'm, I'm not looking to uh, give up the salary entirely, mm-hmm. but I am looking into. I've, I've worked already with some organizations that I know that I could, uh, you know, get into, but would pay about a third of what I'm what I'm making. Okay. So it, if if I looked forward, if I said in three or four years, let's just call it four years, and, and your wife also in her mid-50s? My wife, yes, yeah, she's 54. Okay. So if we looked at, you know, four or five years from now, um, and you went from making 50 to, uh, 150 to 50, right? Yes. And your wife, would she continue to work part-time also? So could I can could we look at, say, having you guys make 100 grand a year or so together for until you reach your full retirement age for Social Security purposes? Yes. Okay, great. And your wife is part time, but I she's a nurse. So do you get her your benefits through her? Correct. Okay, great. If you guys made a hundred grand a year, would that be enough 
after because I'm thinking also after college, right? Would that be enough to kind of float your general expenses? Oh, yeah. Not a, not a problem. Fantastic. All right. So now we get into the fun stuff. So you've already saved a million bucks for retirement, a little bit more. Um, you've got other money that's set aside, which is great. My question to you is, how is your money currently invested? Okay. I am 75% in stocks and 25% in bonds. And I just recently changed that. Uh, only because of, I, I, I did a couple of different um, analysis through various websites, and it kept on coming back to that that type of allocation. Okay, so that's where I that's where I am right now. So here's my question to you: Let's presume in the next five years that you know you're going to keep putting money away, and also let's presume in the next five years that there will be a bear market and there will be a recession. So let's talk about those individually. If you looked at like, hey, there's a recession, are you at risk to lose your job? No. No. Okay, good. Obviously, people still get sick during uh, recessions, so being a nurse is a good job. Uh, If you looked at your total portfolio, which has probably been scorching fantastic for the last, you know, obviously um, 10 years or so, if you saw your million dollars go to 800, could you prevent yourself from selling? Yes, I can. Okay. Does your wife have a similar risk appetite as you? She she does. And the one thing that's been interesting is that, you know, again, as you reach 55, it's kind of started to moderate mm-hmm. where we were high risk. And then all of a sudden, the, the uh, we just said, okay, we need to kind of uh, take our foot off the pedal a little mm-hmm. bit. And that's why that's 75, 25. Uh, but yeah, we're we're probably you know jumping. If I lost twenty percent, that's yeah. not a problem. I'm I'm concerned about that fifty huge drop. Yeah, the problem with the um, with the allocation as it stands right now is not that it'll blow up your whole retirement because it probably won't. It's that you may feel uptight if something bad happens in the economy, if something bad happens in the markets, that leads to uh, an outcome that would change your forward progress towards this different game plan. So if you feel like that three to four year goal of kind of downshifting is really important, then I would say to you, I think you're still taking too much risk. Okay. All right. So again, I am telling you this because I am a wimp. Let's think about the money that you're going to access and in what order you would access it, right? So the money that's a non-qualified investment, right? And just a plain old investment account, not retirement, not Roth, right? I would say that that is definitely a candidate for a 60-40, okay? Then the next would be your deferred accounts. And I would say that that would be a candidate to go, I don't know, maybe 65-35 or maybe maybe 70-30, okay? And then the the Roth accounts, I think you can keep pressing down the accelerator because it's the last money that you're going to access. So that, to me, I, I'm fine with you being 75-25. But I would just pull back the risk a little bit. Okay, now, here's your big goal. During the break, go to JillOnMoney.com and just make it a bookmark. Bookmark that website. You'll see all sorts of good stuff there. JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. We would. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Or if you're on the website, jillonmoney.com. We love hearing from you. We love getting you on the air. And that's why we are going out right now for a caller. It's John in North Carolina. So I'm in a good spot. My wife and I are in a good spot. She just started a new job um, after staying at home, working her butt off, taking care of our kids for 16 years. She started back full-time making a very strong six-figure income coupled with my very good, strong six-figure income. And our good dilemma is what do we do with 
the extra money. Mm, I love extra money problems. So yeah. how much money do you have extra each month, would you guess? Uh, probably close to $3,800, $4,000 a month. Okay. Give me a sort of big picture. How old are you guys, kids, debt, all that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, I am 56. My wife is 49. Um, I We have two kids in high school. One is a just started her junior year, and my son just started his sophomore year. Both are expecting to go to college, which is going to factor into all of our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, Retirement-wise, um, my uh, 401K and IRAs totals about um, – actually, both of our retirement accounts together total about $730,000. Great. And it was only – after listening to the, to your show and when Ed Slot was on that, I learned about the backdoor IRA, mm. or the backdoor Roth. Mm -hmm. um, the fortunate thing is that she got this uh, full-time job um, right around the time we started to plan on doing that. Okay. So now with her new job, she is able to fully fund her 401k. So we're putting 20% of her income into her 401k. And then next year, we'll start adding the 6k into that as well. How much longer do you want to work? <laughs> um, probably 12 years. Okay. I'm thinking of uh, retirement at 67, 68 years old. Okay. And how much do you think you need to live on in retirement? Our plan is uh, right now about 120 k a year. All right. How much are you living on right now? Um, probably... So, we, I mean, we literally just started. She just started the 1st of August. So literally we've been living on my paycheck alone. Okay. Um, and I, I think that nets out to $9,400 a month. Okay. All right. As long as you, like, have run these numbers and you feel okay with it, then yeah. that's fine. I think that the other part of this is that, you know, this is new to you. Um, I, I, are you clear that this is, like, something she wants to do? In other words, is she wanting to stay at work for the next 12 years? or do you? Is there any risk that she's like, I'm out of here, I'm not going to do this? Um, I don't think so. You know, she uh, it adds a whole lot of, of self-confidence to her, mm -hmm. um, getting back into the workforce, being hired on as a manager, yeah. uh, managing other people in a career that she had before she stepped out to take care of the kids. Yep. Um, and she feels like she's contributing to the retirement. She feels it's taking stress off of me, which, you know, honestly, it is. You know, there's a whole lot of emotional things in it, too, as I, I'm sure you can appreciate as, um, as a woman in the sense that for 16 years she didn't feel like she was contributing to our retirement, our, um, you know, monthly cash flow and things along those lines, even though she was, she's the COO, right? Mm -hmm. uh, running everything in the household. Um, and now this just gives her an emotional um, – and financial boost in our relationship. And um, it's really cool to see. It's really nice. That's awesome. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think it does, it's like the working has huge benefits, especially for people mm -hmm. who've been out of the workforce for a long time. So here's what I would say to you. You're on track to start putting away a lot more money. The extra money a mo each month, are you thinking about this in terms of a supplement to your retirement or are you thinking about this as you're going to need this to pay for college? Because you're going to have two kids in college at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's let, let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have, um, as I'm looking at my numbers right now, we have $40,000 in um, 529 total. Okay. Got it. We've been putting 400 a month, um, 200 for each kid for the mm. past however many years. And so the question the, the one of the burning things that, that, that I'm sure you're getting into is, is it worth it to throw money into a 529? Do we put it in a brokerage account? Do we put it in a savings account? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I would prefer to be, go into the 529 if you really think you're going to be, I mean, are, are both both kids are college bound. Are they public or private school kinds of, of students? <laughs> um, Don't throw your daughter under the bus on me. No, no, not at all. All right. I mean, she's already toured MIT. She went. She, she we toured Harvard and we went uh, and visited um, close to NYU. Uh -huh. we walked past it and she did not fall in love with NYU. The Fine, people. it's overrated. Uh, MIT's not though. So private school is definitely a, a possibility. And what we have communicated to our kids is, 
you get into the school that you want, mm -hmm. um, that we think is going to have a high payback mm -hmm. um, as well, of course, but don't worry about paying for college. We will figure that out on the back end. Um, it's not an open door in that if we have to pay 70 bucks, 70,000 a year for a degree, for a bachelor's degree, that's probably not going to fly. Right. I think that what I'm trying to figure out is that, you know, how much of this money that really should go towards education, how much kind of juices up your yep. overall retirement planning. I presume neither of you is will be entitled to a pension going forward? Correct. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit, um, I want to, I really, I mean, you're putting away 43000 it'll and it'll be, you know, obviously it's going to be more. It's going to be almost fifty grand a year. If we look at the company match, mm -hmm. I think the number comes up to be about um, $74,000 a year. Holy smokes. I'm liking that. Yeah, and so if you, if you work, again, if you work for 10 or 12 more years, that's real money. So yeah. here's what I think you should do. I think that the four grand a month, that you have is is certainly available and you can make that for college okay the reason why i like a 529 plan plan is that you get some cover when it comes to your taxation because now your tax bracket's going to be higher right how much money do you have in non-retirement assets anything do you have like a, a an emergency reserve fund yeah we have an emergency reserve fund um it's probably right now around $30,000. Mm -hmm. um, and our, uh, so very near term, it is to um, pump that back up to 50, which is where we see it needs to be yeah. for an emergency fund. Agreed. At the end of the year, I typically get about a forty to $45,000 bonus. Um, and that's, our plan in December is essentially to, to build that back up. Okay, so you top off emergency reserves. What about a brokerage account, just a plain vanilla brokerage account? Do you have one of those as well? Um, we have one, but it's got less than a thousand bucks in it. So here's what I would do. You know, obviously, you can only put fifteen grand a year for each kid for the five twenty nine, but you can do fifteen grand times two, right? Because you're a married mm -hmm. couple. So I would uh, pump, uh, right, so I would pump the money into the 529 plan. It doesn't really matter because the money is fungible between the two of them, right? So I would just do it equally, and they're so close in age that you can get the money back and forth. I would do that. That's going to be a portion of the four grand a month, and the rest of it i dump into the investment account. I would use the 529, the tax-sheltered part of the 529, as long as I could, and you know what you could do is, depending on what happens with your daughter, she gets into MIT and they say, oh, my God, we've been dying to have kids from Rally. You're going to get a scholarship and it's not going to be all that money, right? Maybe maybe it's not going to be mm -hmm. the full 70, but let's see what happens. But you could use some of your investment account along the way if you had to. Okay. I love your wife for doing this. It's a, It's like really, it is a game changer. So I, I applaud her for taking the plunge. It's hard to go back to work, I imagine, having only worked for the last 30, 100 million years for myself. But uh, my sister went back and I know that it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. And, uh, but I agree with you, a lot of psychic benefits from doing this. Very much so. And thank you so much for, uh, for taking my call and your encouragement. Of course. Love listening to your show. Okay, we'll be right back with Jill on Money. During the break, maybe you want to go on to that website, jillonmoney.com, and buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a question about your financial life, we'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com or go to the website, JillOnMoney.com. Lots of great resources there, lots of fun articles, videos, all sorts of stuff. And uh, if you're thinking about something while you're on the website, just hit the contact button and you'll be able to send us a note. Easy to do. Okay. This is from Tim who says, I plan on retiring in April of next year, and I will be 60, 61 years old. Man, that is young to be retiring. Right, Mark? It feels young to me. My spouse is uh, already retired, a school teacher. We have combined pensions, 70000 bucks. 
we have one hundred sixty thousand dollars in after tax savings. My spouse has three hundred grand in a traditional IRA. I've got one and a half million bucks in an employer sponsored four hundred one k. Our plan is to use that um, one hundred sixty thousand dollars of after tax savings to supplement our pensions through twenty twenty two. And then we'll use my spouse IRA to supplement the pensions. And then, you know, it's going out years, four years. And then in 2027, when then he'll start tapping the 401k and deferring Social Security to age 70, assuming I'm still in good health. My 401k is invested in target date funds. Appreciate your thoughts on our plan, including your thoughts on my spouse IRA investments for the next three years and my 401k investments for the next seven years. Sounds like you're like rocking and rolling. You got the plan. Um, If you are going to tap into money and you know that you're going to need that money, you want to just reduce the risk as you approach that. So, you know, if you're thinking about this in sort of tiers, the money that you're going to access sooner within three years, you want to make sure that you really ratchet down the risk. And by the way, keep a little extra cash in these accounts. That's really going to be important. That way you can be sure that, you know, you don't have to get yourself too crazy if the markets are going nutty, right? That's important. Okay. Okay. Here's a question from somebody who was um, uh, trying to choose between different kinds of financial planners. So one plan, one planner was saying that um, there was two different life insurance policies, a whole life insurance policy, and then a variable universal life policy. And there's all these questions about life insurance. And um, the person who writes this says, I have life short-term disability and long-term disability from my employer. Um, I, so the answer to the question is, do not buy whole life insurance policy or variable universal life and policy. You can now know that each of these people are not worth working with because I don't see why exactly you need to have these two different kinds of life insurance plans. If you need life insurance, chances are you should just buy term life insurance. And anyone who's going to sell you these variable policies, probably not really worth it for you. That's what I would say. It's so much easier to just peel away the onion in that respect. Peggy writes, I'm 73. I'm single and retired. I worked for a bank for 36 years. I have Um, At USAA, a brokerage IRA has less than $35,000 and a savings annuity, it's not paying out to me, has $65,000. Okay, this is a long story, long story, long story, long story that doesn't really matter to anyone else listening. Um, And the question really is like, what do you do with all this? You know, you've got, I've got $25,000 in credit card debt. What's the advice here? Okay, Peggy. So you're 73 years old. You've got about 100 grand that's in that's saved. You should not have this money at risk. That's number 1. So you can have a CD and if you've got money that's in an annuity, make sure that it is just a boring annuity and that 2% is just fine. However, um if you've got credit card debt, you're going to have to make sure that you pay down that debt as quickly as you can. So my guess is you're going to have to slowly pull some extra money out of these accounts to try to pay down the debt. And that way your cash flow can actually afford what your lifestyle is, I think. Hopefully that will help you out. You can pull some of the money out. Don't pull it all out at once to pop you into a different tax bracket. Pull enough out to put a, you know, kind of get a hold on it. And then slowly but surely, you're going to have to whittle it down. That's it. There's no uh, magic solutions here, I'm sorry to say. And Jason is wondering uh, what when you should refinance a mortgage. I, I've read that one should wait till a 1% to 2% change. Not necessarily. First of all, um, the costs have to be factored in. How long you're staying into a house would have to be factored in. And the idea here is that... Um, not to go crazy with a refi, but you want to figure out what's your break even. How long will it take you to recoup the cost of these uh, of the refi? Don't just do it because someone says, go do it and I can get you a good rate. You want to know exactly 
how long it's going to take you and whether it makes sense for you. Remember, these do have costs. You have to factor that in. Eileen writes that her 18-year-old daughter has $5,000 to invest and she wants some guidance. And like anything else, it really depends when you need the money. If she needs to buy a car in two years, she can't be very aggressive. But if this is kind of like a longer-term investment, then she could certainly go to a place like Vanguard or Schwab or T. Rowe Price or TD Ameritrade or Fidelity, and she could put it into a either a mutual fund or a target date fund, something longer-term. But in essence, this really boils down to when do you think she'll need the money? That'll help us guide you a little bit better. Patricia is 68 years old. She's got a monthly income of 3900 bucks. Home is paid for. Um, I have approximately... I had to read this a million dollars in IRAs and investments. I'm not concerned about myself. I am concerned for my adult children who are in their 40s. They don't have any money saved. One has debt. It's my hope that each of them will inherit it about $100,000, maybe a little bit more. My question is about the safety of that money going to them and whether their creditors can go after them for a share of that. I have a handicapped son for whom a special needs trust has been established. Any special way to set up a trust for them so that the money can't be attached? Um, I, this is a legal question, but I don't think you can do this. I mean, you can do it as a special needs trust, but if the kid doesn't have special needs, no, I don't think you can. Um, but you should talk to a lawyer about that. Maybe there is a way. So check that out with a lawyer, Patricia, and good luck. Okay, you're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question... Give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at JillOnMoney. Now back to the show. You are back. It's late September here in New York. Coming into Mark's favorite month of the year, October, because you like crashes, right? All right, no. He's a fall kind of guy. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. I got a, a note from somebody who asked, what are the most trusted banks? That's the subject line. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh, so... Kara says, I want to put this, I want to put money into a different bank than I currently have. Um, I'm 54. I'm permanently disabled. I cannot lose any money for my future. It's not that large of an amount. So the real issue here is that, I mean, trust in banks and trust in financial institutions, you know, they're all going to probably be subject to hacks and all that kind of stuff. You can't really control that. Um, The question of a bank versus a credit union versus an online bank, it's all about what kind of protection do they have in the event of their own failure? So if you don't, you know, FDIC insurance is carried on most for online banks as well as for brick and mortar banks. Credit unions have different kind of protection, which I think is called NCUA, which is the credit union protection. It doesn't really it doesn't really matter which one. Um, I, I don't think you should worry too much about it. And um, as long as you're below that FDIC limit of 250 grand, then that's all you really need to know. All right. John asks, um, if I'm taxed the same um, on passive income, why can't I invest that money into an IRA rather than it's what rather than um, the earned income? So he's like, this is like, wait a minute. If passive income is ordinary income, why is it not earned income? I don't know, John. That's the rule. I mean, I'm sorry. That's the rule. What do you think, Mark? Them's the rules, Mark says. Paul uh, wants to know um, the following. I am 78 years old. My wife is 73. We've got a home with land. It's worth about $550,000, no mortgage. Question, if I were to put this into an irrevocable trust, an irrevocable trust, ladies and gentlemen, means you put the house in the trust and you can't change it, can't get it out after, it's a pain in the neck. Um, Would I be able to acquire monies from its value to pay medical bills if needed? I don't know the answer to this. I think the deal is 
if you put the house into an irrevocable trust, um, the the next question being is, you know, can you, you know, what about this about, you know, a nursing home? Could it take that money? The The problem here is this. An irrevocable trust may be a way to protect an asset, whether it's, reg, you know, plain old money or a house or anything else. But the in order to be able to protect it fully, it has to be in that trust for five years to avoid a look back period. And if you want the flexibility to pay medical bills or do this, that and the other thing, you're going to really have to talk to a lawyer because irrevocable trusts have very specific rules that need to be laid out. So my my advice is, first of all, be careful about when you put houses in trusts. And second of all, make sure you talk to a qualified estate attorney. I wouldn't even go to an elder care attorney. Talk to an estate attorney. They will know this. Uh, let's see. Diane has a bunch of H bonds that were given to me as a child. I'm 50 years old now. Many of these bonds have matured. They are no longer interest. Uh, they are no longer earning interest. Can I roll them into CDs? First, you have to actually get rid of the bonds. So you have to go through the Treasury, treasurydirect.gov, uh, and you've got to sell the, the the H bonds. And guess what? You've got to pay all the tax that's due. And then you can do whatever you want with the money. You can roll it into a CD, but you cannot, you have to take the tax hit. And you cannot put this money into retirement accounts. This money must go first to you because it's not these are taxable bonds you have to pay the tax then you can do whatever you want with them and you cannot then go put them in an ira account you could if you had earned income but you can't just roll that into your 403b account okay rick writes my wife is reading an investment book that's taking talking about funding a whole life insurance policy using that as a bank for your loans and tax-free investing i've been taught that whole life was an expensive form of investing Rick, I agree. <laughs> Can I leave it at that? Can I please? Yeah, I, I'm not into these uh, shenanigans around using life insurance as investments. I mean, it's okay now that we have some actually cheaper forms of whole life and even permanent life insurance, maybe, but be very careful. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is from somebody named RJ. Our pre-retirement plan is to pay off all of our expenses and to build up two to three years of living expenses and cash to live off of in case the stock market crashes the day I retire. Does this make sense? Yes. I love that. I think two years in the bank is great. Another question. um, Why would anyone ever invest in bonds at this point? Because bond prices are up and yields are down. Because you want consistency of income. That's why. And you don't have to only invest in the bonds that have gone up by the most in value you can use an intermediate term bond but we invest in bonds because they provide reliable income that's really why and they act differently than stocks okay (sighs) there we go that's it when we return more of your questions during the break hop onto our website it's called jillonmoney.com and you can Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Okay, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, just shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That is what Frank did. Frank says, I'm 57 and a half, and I've got a 401k with about $250,000 in it, an IRA with $64,000 in it, a checking account with $96,000, and CDs with four hundred grand. Good deal. Okay, here's the plan. I want to retire and use my checking account to cover monthly expenses until I turn 59 and a half. My question is, when I turn 59 and a half, from which accounts do I tap? In other words, during retirement, should one withdraw from retirement accounts first and then tap into liquid assets or vice versa? 
So the answer to this is you want to use assets that have already been taxed first. And since you've got almost a half a million dollars that is available to you, you know, between your checking and your CDs, I would say that's the money you should really think about using. And in fact, I I would delay pulling money out of my 401k and just let that tax deferral build up. Um, You're pretty young, so I don't know what the deal is here. Like, I don't know if you've got, is there a pension that's potentially coming? Is there, um, you know, I don't think so. But I don't know, like, how much money do you think you really need to live on? That's one of the big questions. So, you know, yes, you want to tap these monies first, but I feel like I'm missing a part of your overall game plan. And I would be delighted to talk to you, Frank, if you want to kind of chat about that game plan. I just, I'm worried that, you know, you think you have a bunch of money, but maybe it's not as much as you think. I don't know how much money you need to spend in your retirement. So I would just, I would want you to keep that in, in mind because, um, I'd, I'd hate for you to shortchange yourself. And you could just keep working a couple of years. You're young. Okay, you are listening to Jill on Money. And we are broadcasting live from the Capital One studios. We have a whole nother hour in store. But during the break, why don't you hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can listen to old shows, watch some videos, and check out our resource section. There's a lot of good stuff there. jillonmoney.com. That's the web address. And the show is coincidentally called Jill on Money. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's hour number two of Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Go to policygenius.com. Mark is just on top of the situation right here. He's running the show. He's running Jill on Money. He's running my life. It's great. But he said we need to answer these emails. So this is a, an all-email segment, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, you know, sometimes I just want to make sure that we get through these and answer your questions. If you have a financial question, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And you can also be hopping onto the website, Jill on Money. Jillonmoney.com, there's a contact button in the upper right-hand corner. You can read all the great stuff we've recently written, and you can listen to past shows. You can watch some of my TV segments. Oh, by the way, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter, which is fantastic. Buy our book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. Okay, let's do some emails. This is from Patty. I'm 56. My husband's 59. We would like to retire in three years. I realize that some say... It's best to collect Social Security as late as possible. But in order for us to retire in three years, my husband will need to start taking his Social Security at 62. (sighs) Let me just interject. When you take Social Security early at age 62, your benefit is permanently reduced for the rest of your life. Permanent. Okay? So that's why people say wait till your full retirement age, which for you guys is probably 66 or 67. Mark. Permanent. Permanent. He's going to, you know, edit out one of those permanents. But I'm just saying it's permanent because people don't get that. All right. So Patty says, I may or may not wait past 62 to take my own Social Security, but I may not have to. Okay. In addition to his Social Security, we'll have $1.2 million in 401ks. My advisor is saying I should expect to earn one and a half to two and a half percent rate of return on those funds. He doesn't mean one and a half to two and a half percent, I don't think. I think what he's saying is um, maybe he's saying that you should be trying to withdraw one and a half to two and a half percent. You should make sure you understand what he's actually saying. When people in the advisory business, they sometimes will say, you know, you can safely pull one and a half to two and a half percent out. I think what he that's a withdrawal rate. So. I'd be interested to know exactly what he's talking about. 
But more importantly, I'd really if if all of the money that you have is one point two million dollars in four hundred one k funds, and they haven't been taxed yet. Remember that. So you don't really have one point two million. You have one point two million less the taxes owed. You have to understand that those two social security checks plus whatever you pull out of the 401k, that's it. That's all you got. So I really would be very interesting, interested, sorry, to see what would happen if you both worked until you were 62 or 65 and see how the numbers work. And you haven't necessarily, I don't know what you really need. Um, you say 4% is the mark to make my budget work and retire in three years. I don't know. You're 56. Why are you retiring at 59? I feel like you're really close. So, Patty, I would love more information, um, and I would be very careful. Very, very careful. Okay, here's a uh, Monica is 66 in nine months. My husband passed away back in 2013. He had been disabled. Um, I was 60 years old when I started getting a portion of his Social Security retirement benefits. I was working full time until January of this year. And now I and now owe money back. How do I get Social Security to do over my calculations? Hopefully, I don't have to pay back as much or any and get a larger check every month. I'm really struggling. I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. I know. I think that you're going to have to go. I would tell you what. I would go to Social Security to the website and start playing with these numbers. I, I, I am not sure. Like if they say you owe money back, you usually do. If you have a problem, I actually would call them. Oddly enough, calling really does work and get a human being on the phone, explain the situation. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't know the nuance of this particular situation. Um, okay, who's this from? Sean, my family has... Um, my family has owned biz. Should my husband collect Social Security early and still draw a limited taxable salary and the rest may be in cash? No. No. What are you people talking about? Stop, stop, stop. Don't pull your Social... Do not, do not claim Social Security early. Don't do it. And, you know, you. there's always like a little bit of... Um, I always feel like some small business owners are tempted to do a little gray area... Social Security calculating. And um, in my mind, you're just robbing yourself of what is essentially a fantastic benefit, Social Security, that can increase in value every year you wait to tap it. So wait until full retirement age, please. Okay. Wendy writes, recently sold home, credit score plummeted from 842 to 808. I wouldn't call. Mark says that's not a plummet. You're still over 800. You're still considered the top of the of the credit score peer. Seems unreasonable and unfair. I still own a five hundred thousand dollar home without a mortgage, but sold rental with mortgage. Sent okay. Well, whatever you know, like I wouldn't go crazy about this. You know, you still have good credit. Um, when you sell, when you pay down a mortgage, you have less mortgage available. So it kind of messes with the FICO score, but it doesn't matter really. The second part of the question is, unless you want to go out and buy another home or borrow money, in which case you're still an 800, you have more than 800 score and you're going to get good credit rates as well. Anyway, so, okay. Second part, I want advice on how to find out the particulars on reverse mortgages and if they are a viable alternative for me. Hey, how about this? Mark, do you think this is a good candidate to buy the book? I have a whole section on reverse mortgages. Um, be very careful with reverse mortgages because you don't say how old you are, but I, I think it says, let's see. Okay. Oh, here. the She's so 64 and a half. A reverse mortgage does not work as well when you are uh, under the age of 70. It's available as early as 62, but I would not look at it and wait. And I would get a lot of critical, um, objective advice around a reverse mortgage. You may want to hire a fee-only financial planner. Okay. Um, okay. This is from Cliff. My wife and I are looking to maximize our retirement funds. We're interested in a backdoor Roth. We max out our 401k. We're not sure how the backdoor IRA Roth IRA process works. We make 285 grand base, about 325 with bonus. I'm 33 and my wife is 32. Uh, okay, so 
long story short is, first of all, you should find out whether your employers might interest might might add a Roth option to your 401k and you should lobby for it because it really doesn't cost them much more money and they should do it. But otherwise, what you do is you make a contribution into um I want to make sure you have no other Roths here, uh, no other IRAs. So they got money in 401ks in brokerage and cash. So the, you make a non-deductible contribution into an IRA account, and then you immediately convert it into a Roth. That's how it works, Cliff. You could just do this at any, bro- wherever you hold your brokerage fund or no load mutual fund house. That's how you do it. Non-deductible IRA convert it into a Roth. Make sure there's no other IRAs holding us floating around or else it could change the calculation. You're listening to Jill on Money. Check us out, jillonmoney.com and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we want to hear from you. Send us an email, ask Jill at JillonMoney.com, or just go to the website, JillonMoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. And you can always contact us. We've got a little contact button, top right corner. So please do that. And we're trying to dig out from emails. And we love your emails. Just apologize if it takes a little bit longer to get back to them, catching up from the summer. So here is a uh, an email from Fazia, who likes reading my weekend articles in the Sun Sentinel. I write these articles for Tribune. We usually post them on our website. So don't worry if you don't get it. Um, Okay, here's a question. We are retired and have invested in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, which have not performed very well for us. How's that possible? All right. Now that the market is uncertain, we're not sure if we should stay or in the market or invest in annuities to preserve our principal. We are more concerned about preserving principal and earning some income than the growing the portfolio. Okay, you don't have to invest in in an annuity to do that. You really don't. What you can do instead is make your portfolio less risky. And I don't know what kind of bonds you have, but if you have lower risk bonds, meaning short or intermediate term bonds, and you kind of pull the risk back on the on the bond holdings, you make sure that the kind of stock positions you have are, you know, more on the value side, less the growth side, that might be worth it. But If you're managing the money yourself and you're not happy with the performance, you know you only have yourself to blame. But if someone else is doing it, then indeed you have to really decide whether or not you want that person to continue doing it. So when you're really concerned about principal and earning some income, what you can do, I would never get out of markets altogether. But if you have enough money, if you have enough income, if you have a portfolio that's large enough, it may be very well worth your while to take a look, reduce the risk, but then don't be tempted to change it because you know the market's going to shift and you cannot be just hooked into that sentiment that I call it the fear-greed cycle so that when you're fearful, you pull out of all the risky stuff, but then when things turn around, you might get greedy and put it back in. But if you send me a little bit more detail, current like, you know, you say you're retired, but are you drawing from these it funds? How much money do you need in retirement? All of those things that to me would be helpful in helping to uh, helpful in help in, in uh, guiding you a little bit more. OK, Christine says my spouse and I are retired federal employees. Poof. God bless you. He went back to work for a private employer. He's got a pension, a pension of sixty thousand dollars. I guess a year. That's what I'm guessing. His pension is $60,000 a year. Hers is smaller, $6,000. Most of our money is in a thrift savings plan. It's about $300,000. We haven't claimed Social Security yet. My husband is 66. I'm 64. Our total cash is about $100,000. We want to grow our money for retirement. And a financial planner said it will cost 1.75% of our total to hire him. Do you think we can afford this guy? I mean, you can afford it, but I don't think you need him. Why do you need this guy? What you need to be doing 
is waiting to claim Social Security as long as you can. And one thing, you you know, given that he's got a pension, you have a pension, he's back to work. I'm hoping you don't need the money from Social Security. And I'm hoping that you don't need to touch the money in the thrift savings plan. And so I actually would not I I don't see why you would necessarily need this person. Um, Specifically, I want to be clear for everyone that if you don't need to claim Social Security, waiting until age 70 gives you this amazing benefit. It's about 8 percent a year increase in your Social Security benefit. Amazing. So let's try to really try to tamp down the urge to number one, claim early or even claim in your full retirement age if you can stand to wait and two, tamp down that urge to hire somebody to manage your money when you've got the thrift savings plan which is a really good plan if you need help with the allocation give us a holler we'll help you out uh okay this is from nathan i retired from the army last year and prior to retirement i transferred two years of my 911 gi bill to my daughter I am also saving money in an investment account to supplement the GI Bill when my child goes to college in 10 to 12 years. My question, with what I have been doing, do I need to use a 529 plan to save more money for college instead of using the investment account? Um, I mean, I don't know. Where is the kid going to go to school? We don't know. I mean, you could certainly use the 529 for supplemental costs. Um, it, it may be that the 529 will give you a better tax benefit. Um, but if you think that you've got enough money saved, you, you can just, you know, you can do saving for college. There's tons of college calculators out there and they'll tell you how much money you need to save. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I think that don't go too crazy, especially if you only have one child. But I mean, I love the 529 plan. It's like Roth investing for education because the money you put in there grows without any taxation while it's invested, but it also is tax-free when you take it out for qualified education expenses. But I will say that it's not, you know, it doesn't really help you if you don't need to be using that account, okay? Next question, is it a good or bad idea to be investing in a traditional 401k to reduce my taxable income so my taxes are in the lower tax bracket of 22%? I'm 41 years old, I have a Roth IRA, wife does as well, My thrift savings plan and workplace 401k, both are traditional. You know, I've started to really get, uh, yes, I think, look, traditional 401ks are great, but I have started to really jump on board the idea that having a bunch of Roth money and a bunch of pre-tax money is terrific. And remember that the next tax bracket for you is 24%. That's a big wide bracket also. So I, I don't know if... I don't think you're going to make a a bad decision, but if you've got a ton of money in pre-tax, tax-deferred accounts already, and you want to start rounding it out, then sure, you can move more to a a Roth environment. Um, If you have, it's never a bad idea, by the way, to be using a a traditional, so don't worry about that. Okay. Um, Here is a question from James. I'm not sure how the futures market is able to predict or sway the Federal Open Market Committee into lowering interest rates. When the futures market says there's a 96% chance of an interest rate cut by December, why is it a foregone conclusion? Does Jay Powell have to heed the message or the prediction? No, he doesn't have to. And this is a bet. You know, the futures market is a bet on the future. And all it does, it's basically, it's a bet on where you think rates will be. So, you know, if rates are at 2%, And you bet that maybe they'll be at 1.75% six months from now. So that just means that there is a probability. But, you know, markets get it wrong. So, no, it has – one is a market-based prediction, and the Federal Reserve hopefully doesn't have to heed any of it. They just know it, but I think that that's that's about it. Okay, this is from – I don't know. Let's call Rick. Um, I have a pension as well as Social Security. I'm drawing monthly income from an IRA, my required minimum distribution. I contribute. A th- Listen to this. I mean, I love a guy who's uh, who's already actually retired and he's contributing a thousand dollars a month to a Vanguard balanced index fund. I've got no outstanding debt. I also have fifty thousand dollars in 12 month CDs. 
small income from an annuity that will pay me for the next four years. I'm 72, good health. I've got long-term care policies for me and my wife. She has her own investments and will begin her required minimum distribution soon. Am I doing enough? Doing enough? You're amazing, man. I Give me a 72-year-old who's saving 1000 bucks a month. How about that, Mark? That's going to be you. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, I've always done my own investing, he says. My wife is with Edward Jones. My expenses with the index funds are minimal. I think you're doing great. Keep it up. Fantastic. Very psyched. All right, it's Jill on Money. If you would like to get on the air with us, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. It's easy. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Head over to the website. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a question, anything, it could be how to talk to your kids about money. You know, I love that website, Beth Kobliner's website, BethKobliner.com. Beth with a K is Kobliner, BethKobliner.com. We need to talk college. She was instrumental in helping to create the Money As You Grow website that you can find at consumerfinance.gov slash money as you grow. We want to talk to our kids about money because we don't want them to inherit our very bad habits. That gets passed along quite quite um, seamlessly. All right, here is a question from Molly. She's 34 years old. She writes, I still owe my parents $15,000 from a personal college loan that they provided interest-free. Ooh, baby. I paid over half of it down over the years. She says, my Bachelor of Arts was crazy expensive, but they pushed towards a private, uh, but they pushed me towards a private education. Okay, here's the question. I have liquid cash right now that I could just pay it all back. I was planning on buying a home, but I don't know if I want to stay in the same state long term. Should I just throw cash at them or invest this liquid amount of about $23,000? I think I know the answer, but I want my parent want to be considerate of my parents and their loan, even if they don't need the money. Another fun fact, if I wait until I'm 40 years old and I'm not married, they'll just give me 20 grand since that is what all the other kids got. Here's hoping... <laughs> I would be like 40 and a half and get married, maybe. Okay, Molly. So you got 15 grand that you owe. You have $23,000 in cash. I presume you've got no other debt. You didn't mention any other debt. And uh, I I don't know if this liquid account is above and beyond your emergency reserve fund. So two things. One is... You need to have six months of your living expenses at least in the bank. So if you've got that, any amount above that, what I would do is this. I would say to your parents, mom, dad, I have the money. I'm going to send you a check. And if they graciously accept it, so be it. But, you know, they did give you the money. And even if they don't need it, let them tell you. But I think making the gesture is great. I also think that you should wait till you're at least 40 years old to get that 20 grand. What if maybe I've just signed something right now to say that I will not be getting married and then you can get the 20 grand now. Or maybe, maybe, wait a second, maybe what they're going to do, I think this is a possibility. Maybe they will simply forgive the loan. I I would say that to me is... I, I don't know. I'm guessing that's a possibility. What do you think, Mark? For, do you think they forgive it or not? Exactly. Make the gesture and then you have a shot at getting the loan forgiven. That's just my my two cents. Okay. We got another email. Don't worry. We got them, a, a ton of them. Carla. My husband has a job that offers no 401k or retirement plan. He is currently maxing out his Roth IRA. I'm not sure if there are any other options for him. We have a second child on the way. We want to make sure that we're optimizing, maximizing our retirement and general finances. Uh, 
I mean, it, you can have a, it, it, and I presume that you're also, if you're not in, if you don't have a, if you don't have income, you can make a spousal Roth contribution. So are you both making Roth contributions? That would be a question. Um, is, is, is the current, is he currently employed? How do the benefits in general play out? I don't know. It's, it, this is hard to, to do, but if, if he doesn't have a retirement contribution, he doesn't have it. You know, there's nothing really that we can do to change that. I, I will say that if he's work, going to work for a startup and maybe that is something that could come, that would be information I'd want. It's a drag when they don't have retirement plans. That's what I think. Uh, I just did um, a, a public speaking event. I got a bunch of questions that came back. So I want to just, I'm going to blow through these questions Um, because I think they're really good. No names attached, but I I got a whole bunch of them and I thought they were kind of fun. Here we go. When I retire, how much of my 401k do you think should be in an extremely safe, very low risk investment? Would five years of living expenses be the right amount after taking into account that I would get some social security, but also have to pay taxes on my 401k withdrawals? This is a very interesting question. Well, I think that when you retire, I always say you should have one to two years of your living expenses in the bank, not in a 401k. When it comes to the cash position within a 401k, what could be very interesting to consider is this. Cash is an asset class. Cash can be used to mitigate some of the risk in your portfolio. But I wouldn't have five years of cash in your 401k. I might have like maybe a couple of years of what you think you might need to draw from the 401k. See, the thing is, whatever it is, whatever amount of money you think you're going to need from that retirement account, you should be essentially keeping that money in money market accounts. So that's my answer. Another question, why does paying off your mortgage before retirement cause you to lose access to your money? Well, you know, you don't lose access to it. It's just it's gone to pay down the mortgage. If you wanted to go uh, get the money, you'd have to either refinance or get a reverse mortgage, which is cumbersome and costly. So if the money's sitting there in an account, it's available to you. It's liquid. When it's gone to pay down your mortgage, you no longer have access to that money. Um. My advisor has suggested that I put all of my money into a traditional 401k instead of splitting the money between the two, uh, between a a 401k and a Roth. The reason was the reduce the amount of taxes my spouse and I will owe each year. Does it make sense to put all of my money into a traditional 401k? Should I keep my money split with a slight favor to the Roth 401k? Look, this is a, this is really about what you think your tax bracket would be down the line and then also where you think tax rates will be. So it, I mean, I'd, I hate to, I hate to go against your CPA, but, or your advisor, but I would be very remiss in saying that I know the answer to that. So I think splitting kind of splits the difference. Here's a final question. You ready? Mark, what is the ideal retirement age? Wrong. Mark says 65. The answer is there is no answer to that. It depends. Um, the ideal retirement age is the age at which that you can financially support yourself. Don't you, you don't have to put pressure on yourself. And the age at which you can be engaged with your brain and your life. It's so complicated. These are all good questions, though. Okay, you're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It is Jill on Money. Getting ready to do all of your uh, FAFSA forms. Oh, just around the corner. October 1st. Right, Mark? That's the date. Oh, I know. Such a bummer. But you got to do it. Because you cannot get money unless you actually complete the form. You know? It's like the old New York State lottery. You got to be in it to win it. 
Okay, Charlie writes that he enjoys the radio program and the newsletter. Hey, if you all want to get the newsletter, hop on to jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for the free weekly newsletter. Okay, Charlie is 71, single, retired from the military with half of my retirement due to a divorce, a pension from another job and Social Security. Hmm, that's pretty good. Here's the numbers. Military retirement and and pension, $3,700 a month. Social Security, $3,600 a month. All right, I like that. Living expenses, $3,000 a month. I have $1.2 million invested in a slightly bond-heavy portfolio with Vanguard. My house is worth three hundred ninety grand. I paid for it. I've got no other debt. My girlfriend, girlfriend, Mark turns around. All right, so Charlie's 71. He's got a 63-year-old girlfriend. They're going to consolidate households in the next year or so. My house is comfortable but relatively small. She has a much larger house. She plans to sell and move in with me. She has saved well, recently sold her business, so she is financially independent, which is my favorite kind of girlfriend to have, FYI. My house will need an addition and some remodeling to make it roomy and more (laughs) girlfriendly. I love that. I'm making a rough estimate that the addition remodeling is going to cost $150,000 to $200,000. Do you think it would be better to use some of my savings to pay for the home improvements or take out a home equity loan? I don't need my retirement savings for living expenses and save the money as a reserve in case something happened to Social Security or in case I needed long-term care at some point. I'm in excellent health now. I've got good genes, so I expect to last last a while longer. Charlie in Alaska. Uh, Well, so a couple questions. Number one is, so are you going to pay for this out of your own money or is girlfriend going to contribute? What's going to happen to this? So I think this is, okay, so big picture, use cash to do it because you have the cash. There's no reason to pay anything for this. I would just pay for it. The second question is, you are older than your girlfriend. She is going to move in with you. Do you plan on retitling the house so that, or at least dealing with this house so that she inherits the house? And if so, is there some rationale here to have her contribute to some of this construction? I don't know. But I think that one of the things I found out in my book and just like going back and a lot of stories that I had about different kinds of estate issues is that when older people are cohabitating, and this happens all the time now, that we don't pay enough attention to the estate issues that could arise. Do you have kids from another marriage? I don't know. So what I would say is to your the broad question is, yeah, I would just pay cash for it, not use a home equity loan. But the more... I think maybe the, the the bigger issue would be how are you going to handle the ownership of this real estate when you guys have moved in? Okay. All right. So here is a, I got a couple of questions about the Equifax settlement. Um, a lot of people said they definitely they were happy to um, establish a credit freeze. Um, so he said. <laughs> There's one guy, Vic, who said, I had to enter all of my personal information at Experian and it was terrible and it was told I have to send a letter for a credit freeze. Was the information in your article incorrect or did I do something wrong? No, you got to just follow the procedures that they lay out for you, which I know is a drag. So here's a question. This is from Kay who put a... um, a credit freeze on one of her accounts several years ago. She needed to lift it to apply for a credit card. The process was a nightmare. Now, here's the thing. The the process has gotten a lot easier since these credit uh, hacks, essentially. So uh, don't, don't be freaked out. Here's another one. Mark, I don't know what happened here because some people said they had a hard time actually getting the um, settlement, making the um, FTC Equifax settlement. I did it so easily. So I don't know if something's changed, but I would absolutely try to do it again because I didn't think, I don't think that, yeah. Mark didn't, right? We did it with all the same stuff. I haven't gotten my check yet. (laughs) Oh yeah, give me that 125 quick. Right on. Judy... Uh, wrote in about our episode about fiscal therapy. 
Um, who, she said, I don't understand how, why Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system. When it began and people first began paying into it, the money was collected and paid out immediately or was it held in a trust? So the money was collected, paid out immediately until we had way more people paying in than we had people retired. And that's how the trust fund began. That's what happened. Okay. So what she also writes is, I was happy to hear that if we were to t lift the Social Security cap to approximately $200,000 to make it proportionate with today's salary increases, that this is actually something that could be considered. Um, she writes, I love the Jill on Money show. I learned so much from people doing all the right things and from those who have benefited from Jill's advice. Keep sharing the best of your knowledge. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. You are listening to Jill on Money, and uh, we're delighted that you're here. If you've got a question, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. And before we end the program, we want to remind you that we have been broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. You can go to policygenius.com. Uh, okay, this is from Andre, who's uh, 41. He's married, no kids. He maxes out his Roth. He's a U.S. citizen. He lives outside of the U.S. He's got about a 200 grand at Schwab. Half managed by a financial advisor, the other half I manage. Hodgepodge of a bunch of different things. So the question is, um, should I stick with, should I go with a robo-advisor? Should I use Schwab's tools to build a personal ETF portfolio or just go for a target date fund? You know what? I would use uh, the Schwab robo. It's pretty easy. I think it's called Schwab Intelligent Portfolio. It's got a $25,000 minimum. I think that's right. Um, I would use that. It's easy. Um, and then you don't need a you don't need anyone to manage your money. You can do it yourself. So that's what I would do. Totally easy. Don't worry about a thing. You can do this. Uh, okay, here's a question um, from Artem who says, I'm at a bit of a loss where I should start investing. I'm in my late 20s. I've got no debt. I can comfortably save three to four hundred dollars a month. I read, I read your book, but the pitfalls that smart people often make kind of made him stop for a moment. Okay. Any investment better than no investment? Yeah. You know what? If you got three to 400 bucks a month, just open up an account at, you know, Vanguard or Schwab or uh, T. Rowe Price or TD Ameritrade or Fidelity and start your process and just use uh, maybe just a target date fund. Or you could go to Betterment and use a robo advisor. But yeah, get going and just start. That's easy. Um, okay, Mike has two questions. What type of growth should I see from my retirement over the last year? Uh, he says, my portfo portfolio has increased by 6%. More? Should I change who's managing? I don't know because I don't know whether you're a growth investor or a income investor. Second question, I've got my 8- and 12-year-old portfolio um, through Fidelity. You said that Utah has good 529 plans. Only switch 529 plans. If your state's plan isn't good, your state's plan's fine. Don't worry about it. Totally are. Okay, that's it. That's the program. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got a financial question, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com or just go to the website, JillOnMoney.com. We've got a contact button right there, top right. Say hi to Mark when you do it. He's the best producer in the world, and we'll see you next week.